to page 78 in your hymn book if you'd like to use that. Let's sing, O come, all ye faithful, and the Lord truly is faithful, isn't he?
be seated as we turn okay. to page 40 in our hymn book and sing you, the hymn, My Jesus, I Love Thee. song this morning is not in the hymn book, but it will be on the walls for you to look at. Great. 
Scripture, Jesus encouraged anyone who believes that he is the Son of God and that God is his Heavenly Father and ours to call upon the Lord if you have a need and to ask him in faith believing. We've prayed for those that have not been well and those that are struggling this morning as we begin the service. But I want you to know that God wants to bless you. He cares about you. And Scripture says that God is a Father who loves to give good things to His children. passage that says in the teachings of Jesus if a son would ask a father for bread would a father give him a stone sad to say in our society with the deterioration of morality and faith and the understanding of parental responsibility there are many children that are fatherless So in a sense that if a child would say, where's my father and why isn't he here to help me and to walk with me through life? In a sense, some fathers are giving their children worse than a stone. They're giving them nothing but disappointment. But God says, whatsoever you ask in the name of Jesus, believing, you shall receive. God's not going to trick you. He's not going to disappoint you. He's not going to betray you. Scripture is very clear about how should we ask. First, in faith. Second, knowing what God's will is. 
How do we know that? Scripture. We need to read the Word so that when we pray, we're not in resistance or rebellion to what God's will is. And the Bible says we shouldn't pray to heap things on ourselves. We shouldn't pray just to have more. God wants us to have more. He will, as Scripture says, open the windows of heaven and pour out upon blessings uh, on us that we can't contain. We'll have to share it with others. But I'm, I'm taking time to say this before we pray because I think sometimes we do without because we feel like we're not worthy or God's not going to answer our prayer or He's not going to pay attention to our need. But I want to rem remind you that He does care and, and you're just as important to Him as anyone. God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't look at one of His children with more approval and blessing than He does another. His heart loves us all equally and God cares about what's happening to you. So while we have opportunity, with one more admonition, Scripture says, ask largely that your joy may be full. Nothing is impossible with God. Ecclesiastes says, in God's time, He makes all things beautiful. Say it out loud. In God's time, He makes all things beautiful. He's got quite a job to do that in me. But He's going to do it because He's committed to doing it. So I want you to just take a moment and talk to your Father. What do you want? What do you need? The Bible says our God shall supply all our needs according to the riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He didn't say because of what we deserve or have earned. He shall supply our needs according to the riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And he also says that he will give us the desires of our heart. If our heart is right toward Jesus. God, He will give us the desires of our heart. Would you pray? Father, we come to You in this moment, this Sunday Sabbath morning, and we ask, Lord, that You would be attentive to the prayer of Your people. From the youngest child to the eldest adult, Lord, that You would hear us. And Lord, that You would give us confidence faith when we pray this morning you will be able to respond to that which you're asking we thank you Lord for your faithfulness and we are here today because of your faithfulness we know Lord that you do know what our needs are and you do know the desires of our heart oh father would you hear and answer our prayer today? And in the days to come that we would have witness, see with our eye, hear with our ear, and feel with our heart that you are busy accomplishing that which we have asked this Sabbath morning. We thank you, Lord. I thank you. for your great faithfulness and love. Thank you for your gentleness, Lord, with us and patience. And we are, with excitement, looking forward to the day that we will be with you and this struggle of life will have ended. We will finally know the peace and the joy and the completeness, the wholeness of being that you teach us about in Scripture. 
Until that day and that hour, Lord, we will go on believing and praising you for who you are and for all that you do for us. We pray these things in the most precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers today. Thank you, Don, Jim, and Sharon. Good to have Jim and Sharon back home. And it's good to have you again here with us today. I want to talk to you about God's grace and mercy, which are the shield and buckler of the believer. We're going to turn to a passage that we've used uh, frequently, uh, Psalm 91. I, I hope that you uh, read that psalm often and share it with your family. I think there are many passages in Scripture during this time of life and what we're facing that can be a strength and encouragement. There is many passages. Psalm 91 is one of the best, uh, just to remind you of who God is and what he does for those who believe in him and put their trust in him. We're just going to use one verse, verse 4 of Psalm 91. Again, we're going to talk about God's grace and mercy, which are the shield and buckler. God's grace and mercy, which are the shield and buckler of the believer. Psalm 91 4, he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. When we try to understand what grace is, we, it's easier some, for most of us to understand mercy, and that is that we deserve judgment and consequence, and out of God's mercy, He keeps us from having to pay that judgment and consequence. He has mercy on us. Grace has been identified in many ways, but most often when you think of grace, you might hear people say, grace is the unmerited favor. Once God forgives us and has mercy on us and keeps us from paying the consequences of wrong decisions and evil living, he gives us favor, the ability with God's blessing and promise and Holy Spirit strength to go forward and not just exist, but to be victorious in our life, to actually live a life of favor and blessing. I mean, would say, thank you, Father, and bring more of that favor and blessing. Unmerited favor... But it is also, when we think of favor, we think of protection. God's grace and mercy, which are the shield and buckler, in the fourth verse of 91, first chapter of Psalms, it says that thy shield and buckler is truth. And how many have heard the, the word grace? and heard teaching or preaching about it. How many have heard of mercy? How many have actually knew at some point that God had been merciful to you, to your family? How many have known that God has favored you, protected you, provided for you, that it was not anything that you did yourself, but God just did it for you. That is truth. For God said he will never fail. He will never fail one of his promises. 
that are unto those who believe in him. That is a truth. Then let's go to Romans chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. Romans 5, verse 20 and 21. Moreover, the law entered that the offense, that what we did wrong might abound. In other words, the law seemed to exist to identify what we do wrong. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, the Bible teaches in the book of Romans that sin, when it is finished, brings death. That when sin had reigned unto death, verse 21, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So when we look at what Scripture teaches about grace and mercy to those who are trying their best to follow the Lord, he is saying that the grace and mercy of God will be there for you until you get to eternity. Till you make it home safe with your father. Now I'd like to read from the Message Bible, the version that's called the Message. Same verses, Romans 5, 20 and 21. All that passing laws against sin did was produce more lawbreakers. But sin did not and does not have a chance in competition with the aggressive forgiveness we call grace. When sin stands versus grace, grace wins hands down. It's no contest. God's grace is greater than sin in every situation and no matter how much sin there is. Now, you and I have things in our life that if someone did that to us, we would say, that's unforgivable. I'll never forgive you for that. God says there is no sin that you would commit that I would not forgive you for, except for one. And that is saying that the Holy Spirit is a lie when you have known God's forgiveness, love, and mercy in your life and you say that it's a lie, that's called blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And God said he would never forgive anyone for that sin. You look at what's happening in our world today, and um, I, I have honestly deep sorrow in my human heart about what's happening in our world. I, I have some great disappointment, humanly, about the things that we are losing that I knew when I was growing up. There, there was some true innocence in our world. There was some true, uh, wonderful things to experience, humanly, that are being lost out of greed and vileness. People wanting to control and dominate others is evil. But in the midst of all that's happening, I would testify to you today that the grace and the favor of God is extraordinarily powerful. And it is the single most important thing that you need to sustain you moving forward. Whatever we face, we need God's grace and mercy. There will be times that you and I will fail. We will come short 
of what the law would require us to do biblically and even in the sense of the laws of government. We may come to a point that we, we cannot abide what they are requiring. Scripture says to us, God's grace is greater than all our sin. And He has mercy that is everlasting toward us. How many would just be willing to say thank you, Father, for that this morning? All sin can do, verse 21 from the message version of the Bible, all sin can do is threaten us with death. And that's the end of it. That's the worst that sin can do. Grace, because God is putting everything together again through Christ, invites us to enjoy not only life today, but forever. Where sin, the worst that it can do is bring human death. God says, if you will believe in me and follow me, I will give you mercy and extend to you my favor and grace, and you may have life now, today. And Jesus says he doesn't want us just to have <sighs> breathing life, existing. He wants us to have an enjoyable, abundant life. I believe that God can in your day, no matter how dark it may be around you, shine hope and light and love into your life that can make that day enjoyable and worth living. Amen. And then the last part of the verse from the message version says, He wants to give you a life that goes on and on and on, world without end. You're not looking at a point where it's going to come to an end. We, we live in an environment today that should we catch a dreadful disease and things don't go our way, we would die. And yet the Bible says we will go on and on and on and on if we come to put our faith in Jesus Christ and accept Him as our personal Savior God will extend to us mercy and grace for today and life forever. So what is the shield of God? It's the fourth piece of the armor that Paul teaches. We should put on the whole armor of God. Amen? It's called the shield of faith. It is the shield of God. It is faith Believing in God's protection and in God's favor. He tells us to take up the shield of faith in order to extinguish all the flaming arrows that the devil could send our way. To have faith to believe God created not only the world and all living things and sent his only son to die for our sins, but he is preparing a place for us to live a life that never ends. I never thought this would happen to me, but it crept up on me before I realized it. I'm getting old. I was talking to my grandson, my only grandson right now, uh, Elliot, Heidi's son, he called me the other day and, Pappy, can I talk to you? I said, sure. And we talked a little while and I said, what's that on your lip? He's turning 13 and he's got some fuzz growing on his lip that actually shows up. It's, it's dark hair. And I said, are you growing a mustache? And he, he said, no. <laughs> he said, Pappy, I don't want to get old. I want to stay young. I said, I got bad news. <laughs> it's coming. But between now and the time that you get old, there are some great days ahead. 
and God has some wonderful plans. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, not to hurt you or to harm you, but to give you a hope and a future and an expected end. That's a promise to every human being that God has some great plans for you if you will trust him and follow him. But he tells us to take up the shield of faith that 91.4 says is a buckler and a shield. Grace and mercy. Embrace God's mercy so that you can go on without guilt and shame. But also embrace the other aspect of God's protection so that you don't have to walk in weakness. You don't have to walk not understanding and not knowing. God can open the eyes of your heart and your mind and show you things that otherwise you would never see or understand. The shield offers more protection and can be used as a part of the wall of safety. The buckler, most historians say, was the piece of leather or metal that they would strap to their forearm. The shield is what they would use to hold with their hand and would go in front of them. Some shields were as tall as their body and wrapped halfway around in warfare. Some shields were round or the shape of some type of a crest and they would hold it as the enemy would shoot arrows. They would hold it in front of them to deflect the arrows. They, if they drew a sword and would try to strike them, they would hold that shield in front to deflect the sword. But they also had the buckler on their arm that they could stick that out if the shield was lost and it would deflect and defend their body from the strike of a sword that could impel them and take their life. The shield and the buckler of God, as 91 says, he'll cover you with his feather, under his wing shall you trust, and his truth shall be thy shield and his, your buckler. The mercy and grace of God is real. We need God's favor. We can't make it through no matter how bulletproof we may think we are. No matter how healthy our human body may be, accidents can happen and we never know when they will happen or what extent they will have on the effect of our life. But if we have God, no matter what happens, even if we die, Jesus says, yet shall you live. And never die. The buckler is a much lighter and can be used in faster, more aggressive finching without the shoulder becoming too tired. The shield can get heavy. I've worked some construction jobs just, just dealing with the weight of the tools I was using, exhausted. I remember working at Magma Copper Mine when I was in high school. During the summers in my senior year, worked the graveyard shift, and I was a chute tapper. 16 pound double jack, go down underground and find the place where they wanted me to work and where the boulders would come down after they blasted in between shifts and land upon the steel grates. You'd go in with a 16 pound double jack and bust those boulders so that it would fill up the draw and on a hundred feet down there'd be another level and the train cars would come through they'd open the draw and take the ore out and take it to the smelter and bring out copper some things in life are exhausting I can't even imagine trying to spend a day working swinging a 16 pound double jack at this point in my life I barely was able to do it then. My dad taught me a little trick that I gave up after the second time I busted my nose. 
that he would take the double jack, hold it in his hand by the tip of the handle, and bring it down and touch his nose and raise it back up. And I did it a few times until the hurt of the times I couldn't do it and keep it from hitting my nose, I just said, it's not for me anymore. There's things in life that we learn that, no, I'm not going to do that. That's foolish. That's just dumb. I may have learned some of those things. But you know, when I found the Lord and started following and reading His Word, I found some things that God told me, you think you can handle this, but you can't. Don't do that. Don't follow evil. Don't pursue the flesh. Don't become a part of the world because it will eventually kill you. And not only will it kill you, it could kill your family. And God offers us mercy and grace to step outside of that and live a life that does not have to be affected by the judgment of the law or sin. Can you say thank God? Psalm 1830 says, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those who trust in Him. God will be your protection. God will give you mercy and grace, even when you don't deserve it, if you will call on His name and put your trust in Him in the attacks and the weaknesses and the struggles of life. God is your greatest protection because it ne he never fails when you put your trust in him we read in john chapter 8 verse 2 early in the morning he went back to the temple all the people gathered around him and he sat down and began to teach the lord in this passage of john 8 2 is teaching in the temple a multitude has gathered to hear him teach as they often did if you notice the ministry of Jesus, regardless of where he taught, the seashore or a temple or a hillside, large crowds would gather. The reason was that Jesus taught the truth. He taught something that the government did not offer. He taught something that life could not teach you. He brought something that most people did not know existed until they heard him, believed what he said, and began to follow him, and they found out that what he was teaching was true. His words brought hope and life and joy. It transformed them from people who lived in judgment and sorrow, felt enslaved by the circumstances of life. When Jesus came in and they began to hear and follow the teachings of Jesus the Messiah, the rabbi, their lives were changed and hope was found. We read in verse 3 of 8, John, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught committing adultery and they made her stand before them all. Their single intention, now remember, these are religious leaders that have been watching people in, under their control and influence, and they found a woman who broke the law by committing adultery. They went into the house where she was having a relationship with a man that was not her husband, drug her out of the bed, drug her into the street, right from the experience of committing adultery, and they brought him right before Jesus and said, this woman we have caught in adultery, what are you going to do about it? The law said, if you were caught in adultery, not only the woman who had committed adultery, but the man who was with her would be stoned to death. Now, out of John 8, I want to point a couple things out. In our world, for whatever reason, and it's different always, but it's self-motivated. People in power and influence will allow themselves the room to get by with things that they will force others who don't have their position and authority 
they have to yield to it and get under it. We see that in the news constantly. People who are in political positions seem to take liberties that they pass laws in their states and in their cities that says you can't do that. And then they go out and do what they want to do. Now here we see, and we don't know the full story, but just let's just guesstimate. Let's say that the man they caught the woman with, the leaders of the temple knew. And he maybe was an important man in the community and maybe gave a lot of tithes to the church. So they didn't bring him out. They just pulled the woman out of the bed and took her to Jesus because she was insignificant to them. They were, they were going to use her to trap the teachings of Jesus. What will you do with this woman that the law says must be stoned? And Jesus, who is the Son of God. Handle it much differently than the teachers of the church thought he should. What will you do? Jesus looked around and discerned their hearts. The Bible says God does not look at the outward appearance of the circumstance. God looks at the heart of the people who are involved in what's going on. How many have heard that teaching? God does not look at the outward circumstances. He looks at the inward reality. And it says he stooped to the ground with these religious leaders wanting her to be stoned and wanting him to cast the first stone because he claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be a rabbi, a teacher, the Messiah. But he stooped on the ground and began to write. Now I want you to catch something that I never really fully grasp, and I, I'm sure I don't fully grasp it this morning, but in studying and preparing this message for you, the Lord showed me something I had never seen before. Never, it never really opened up to me. It says he stooped on the ground without saying anything and used his finger to write in the dust. Here was the woman who was caught in the bed of adultery. Here were the accusers and a crowd had gathered because he was in the temple teaching. There was a multitude watching. Got the picture? Jesus doesn't say anything. He stoops and begins to write. And as he writes, the accusers who had went into the home waiting for her to get in the bed of adultery, pulled her out of the bed, drug her in the street to the temple to confront the Lord. They wanted to try to embarrass him or cause him to do something that would bring the law of the church down on him. He begins to write and they begin to walk away. When Jesus gets up, he says, Woman, where are thine accusers? As he wrote, they just walked away. The multitude was still there. The woman was still there. Where are thine accusers? And she looked around. There are none. And Jesus says, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one cometh to the Father but by me. We're talking about grace and mercy, the shield and the buckler. She was guilty, caught in the act of adultery. By law, she should have been taken immediately to the street and stoned, and the man that was with her should have been. They didn't bring the man. They just brought her, trying to trick Jesus. Jesus begins to write. Now, we understand, just by the picture of Scripture, that what Jesus began to write must have been things that the accusers, which were the church leaders, were watching, and as they watched what he wrote, they backed away and went away. And Jesus says to the woman, neither do I condemn thee. 
But do you see what happened? When Jesus wrote, he wrote about what these men probably were involved in that they shouldn't have been as religious leaders. It exposed them. But look at what Jesus did. The Bible says he is mercy and grace. He is a shield and a buckler. He is mercy and grace. He is a shield and a buckler. Jesus could have taken their life right then. He could have shouted to the crowd that couldn't really see because they were around Jesus, surrounding him. The woman was in the middle and people were surrounding them. They couldn't see clearly what Jesus was writing, but boy, the accusers could. And as they saw what he was writing, which was truth, it caused them to leave. Jesus did not put them to public shame. Who is the accuser of the brethren? Come on. Who is the accuser of the brethren? Satan is. Evil is what's going to try to embarrass you publicly. Evil is what will drag you out and say, look what he's done. Look what she's done. Satan is the accuser. But when Jesus, who was the law, the word made flesh, the son of God incarnate, he was truth and righteousness. And he says, I can have nothing to do with evil. Darkness and light cannot abide in the same space. Sweet and bitter cannot flow out of the same fountain. And when sin was brought before Jesus, both the one who was literally guilty and in the act of sin, but those who had lived contrary to what God would have them to do, who were religious leaders, God did not put them to public shame. He wrote in the dust and gave them the opportunity to walk away. Basically, he's saying, if I judge this woman, I must judge you because these things are a part of your life. So even to the guilty, he was a shield and a buckler. He protected them from public scrutiny and judgment. They would have surely eventually been brought in. Their jobs would have been taken, their livelihood destroyed, and their reputation gone but the son of God who knows all things did not publicly embarrass them but came to them and said guys before I answer you let's look at what the whole picture is God is merciful the Bible says that God is not willing that we should perish. Remember the Old Testament story of family members that exposed the nakedness of a holy man who had got drunk on wine? See, a lot of Christians think it's their duty to tell everybody how bad you have been or what wrong you have done. That's Satan-inspired. The very Son of God, when he had the opportunity to judge the woman who was guilty and to expose the church leaders who were full of sin themselves, he gave them mercy and grace. He was the one who covered it and gave them an opportunity to go deal with it instead of to lose everything. I just... I've been doing this all week. Sitting down and thinking about how awesome the mercy and the grace of God is. Scripture says it is of his mercy which is our shield and our buckler and because he's a God of grace that we are not consumed. 
We were born in sin, shaping iniquity. And on our best day, we're still not worthy of the blood of Jesus Christ. But you see, I, 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 God really helped me. Because the enemy's always jumping on your shoulder and down, trying to get into your heart and make you feel like you are the lowest of life and you are a miserable failure and you are not worth anything and you don't do anything right. How many has ever heard that kind of talk? <laughs> You're doing your best and he still jumps on you and just trashes you. And it may be true. It may be true. We are flesh. But the Lord, I want you to get this picture because this is the whole gist of the message and we're going to close. The Lord, instead of talking about how awful the woman was, and how great her sin was, and she deserved to be stoned. Instead of making it a big spectacle and saying, why didn't you bring the men? Where's the man? The law says he must be stoned as well. He didn't say that. He stoops and he starts writing, these men who were very angry hated him and hated the woman and wanted public representation of their authority. He began to write, and as he wrote about what was going on in their lives, they walked away. And it was his way of saying, I'm going to give you an opportunity, and I will cover this if you will walk away. Because I want you to understand something about me and my Father. This is Jesus. Our grace is greater than this horrible sin. And I am not going to publicly embarrass you and judge you today. My grace is greater than your sin. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more, he says to the woman. Today's your opportunity. How many have seen that picture that I've just given to you this morning? How many have heard that preached about or taught about? That God did not expose these men. He could have. He's the judge. And the jury. It is of God's grace and mercy that we have not been consumed. He is our shield and buckler. He has protected us. Even when we didn't deserve it, he's been merciful to us. And this morning is an opportunity. We read in John 8, 4 and 5, a teacher, they say, said unto Jesus, this woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. In our law, Moses commanded that such a woman should be stoned to death. Now what do you say? And Jesus says, I do not condemn you. He said, he covers us as a hen gathers her chicks and covers their chicks with her wings to protect them in a time of danger. With his feathers, he covers us. And with his truth of grace and mercy, a shield and a buckler, he protects us and preserves us. Gives us favor. I don't know, I think many of you are on social media. Most of what I see is a practice of casting stones. <laughs> Finding fault. How many have heard the the thought that if you can't say anything good, don't say anything. <laughs> Jesus had a way of identifying sin with talking about grace and mercy. Without being vindictive or ugly or destroying people's lives or reputations, he had a way of identifying truth without being destructive. I'm not willing that you perish. I don't want you to die. 
I read something this last week from a prominent individual in our nation that said those who are causing such upheaval in our nation and trying to bring in socialism ought to die. I hope that's not your opinion. Because God's not willing that they die in sin. But he wants them to come to repentance. Ask God to bring them to the understanding of truth so that they're not eternally lost. Truth gives us no room to pass judgment. Truth provides to us the opportunity to be merciful. What does the Bible say about a good person out of the good treasure of their heart? I want to be a person that is merciful. Quick to forgive. Slow to anger. Amen? I think most of the world would better themselves if they just get rid of their fuse emotionally because the devil's just going to keep lighting it we just need to ask God to take our short fuse away that he'd give us patience and peace and joy and mercy as we close today and prepare for communion Jesus says He who is without sin, as he was writing, that's why we take the understanding that Jesus must have been uh, identifying things in their life that was wrong. Whichever one of you has committed no sin may crass the first stone. I sure couldn't cast a stone. And if we really believe scripture is true when it says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None of us should be casting stones. When they heard this, they left one by one. He straightened up from riding on the ground and he says to her, where are they? Is there no one left to condemn you? No one, sir, she answered. Well, then Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, but do not keep sinning. Today is a day of turning the other direction. If you haven't been following Jesus to the best of your ability with the help of Scripture and the Holy Spirit, today is the day that you ask him to help you. And you turn your life around. If you're a religious person and you have had great faith and, and felt like you were in a position to uh, look at others and make judgments of family members or spouses, then maybe today is your turnaround day to say, God, give me a heart of mercy and grace. Help me to speak your love and your forgiveness into my family. Help me not to be a condemner.